Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I am very uh, pleased to have you here. My name is uh, Dadi Gertler from the Israeli National Cyber uh, Directorate, the INCD. And uh, I will moderate this uh, double panel today uh, with all these uh, distinguished uh, uh, panelists. So uh, we have actually two sessions today. The first panel will be dealing more with uh, airplanes and airlines. The second panel will be more generic, talking about the ecosystem, the whole ecosystem uh, of uh, civil aviation in cyber, of course. Um, so we will start with the first panel, but before, before that, just to, to fill the audience, I will ask uh, the Israeli guys to raise their hand. Okay, about two thirds. That's nice. So uh, I would like to uh, welcome all our guests from abroad. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it very much. And we will start. Shahar Markovic, from Elal, the Chief uh, Digital and the Information Officer. Uh, Kobe, Kobe Zussman from Yata. Brian Connolly from Boeing. Mary McGinley from the DHS, S&T. Inav Chaim Sayag from the INCD. Ruby from uh, Argus, the VP Cybersecurity for uh, Aviation. Okay, we have a full panel, so if uh, you wish, uh, very, very shortly, please, if uh, each and any can just uh, say a few words about himself and his role and, uh, in, the, uh, in the context of this. Uh, you have a, yes, you have a... Hi, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for hosting me here. It's a pleasure. My name is uh, Shahar Markovic. I'm the Chief Digital and Information Officer in Elal, responsible for digital and IT. I joined the company a little bit more than a year ago to start uh, digital and technology transformation. And obviously you can't do a digital and technology transformation without paying a lot of attention to cyber. Uh, before that, I was Chief Digital Officer in Bank Apolim, which was Israel's largest bank. And before that, I was a partner in McKinsey and Company for many years. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Mary McGinley. I'm the Director of Physical and Cybersecurity for DHS Science and Technology. In our role as cybersecurity research and development, we support the broader aviation ecosystem effort of the U.S. government in aviation cybersecurity, and our work here today focuses on aircraft cybersecurity. Hello, everyone. Uh, Daddy, I appreciate the invite. I'm honored to be here uh, and speak. Uh, Brian Conley, I'm the product security officer for the Boeing company. Uh, so I work across our Boeing commercial airplanes, Boeing defense, and Boeing space, uh, driving uh, product security across all of our products, both in development and in sustainment. Uh, I've been there only probably six or seven months. I spent the last 20 years uh, within the U.S. Navy running uh, the cyber resiliency and cyber development within our uh, naval aviation uh, forces within, uh, for the U.S. Navy. So pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Ruby Arbel. I'm the VP Aviation at uh, Argus Cybersecurity. For the last 28, actually it's 29 years I've been a pilot in the Israeli Air Force. And uh, in the last 15 years, uh, I do uh, mainly uh, cyber projects, first uh, in the Army and in the last uh, four years as a civilian. Uh, right now, um, I'm the head of the business unit that uh, develops uh, cyber solutions for the uh, commercial aviation sector. Good afternoon. My name is Kobe Zussman. I'm the country manager for IATA. IATA is the International Air Transport Association, uh, which represents, uh, I would say, like 85% of uh, civil aviation activity on a global level. There are four IATA member airlines here in Israel. And we support the airline industry in a very wide range of activities, uh, financial activities, security activities, operational activities, safety activities, and of course cyber is part of our uh, very important uh, involvement. 
Hi everyone, Inav Chaim Sayag from Israel National Cyber Directorate. I lead the aviation uh, security program uh, for the directorate. And I uh, have background in uh, R&D, uh, in cyber, and uh, security engineering. Thank you very much. So uh, I've drafted uh, some uh, questions for you uh, today. Same for the second panel, okay? So we'll ask uh, questions. Uh, I will direct the questions uh, uh, to you specifically or ask them uh, for you to all to answer. Uh, same for the second. And the last, the, the last 10 minutes of the whole panel, I mean, in uh, about uh, 10 minutes to, to six, I will open to a few, uh, uh, few questions if you have uh, at the end. Okay, so uh, first question, uh, it's uh, for you, Shachar. Uh, what are the unique uh, cyber challenges of an airline uh, while operating the modern airplanes like the Dreamliner, the enabled uh, working airplanes? Okay, um, so to understand the cyber challenges of an airline, I think you first need to understand the business challenges of an airline and those will drive the cyber challenges. Um, you know, we all uh, fly in planes, but uh, not, not many of us actually understand how complex is the airline business. Uh, you know, just imagine the set of activities of uh, turning a plane around after it landed and then bring it back. It's around dealing with the fuel, dealing with the water, dealing with the operation and maintenance, bringing the crew, the cargo, uh, you know, the food, just the food itself. Imagine the logistics of preparing the food for six million people a year, you know, bring it to the plant, taking it back. Um, very, very complex, a lot of different systems, a lot of industries combined, you know, there's also uh, a lot of complexity around maintenance and engineering, uh, as well as uh, uh, e-commerce. So we have uh, probably one of the largest or not the, uh, the largest e-commerce website in Israel, and of course, all the complexity of just running a big enterprise. So uh, that complex business drive uh, complexity in uh, the architecture and uh, as a result, the complexity in uh, the cyber challenges around defending the, uh, that architecture because that means that we have a lot of very, very different systems and each one of those systems represents a specific step in the value chain of an airline and I need to defend that asset. Uh, compare that I come from banking, so in banking you have one big core banking system maybe with some modules around it, but it's one big system that you need to defend. Here I need to defend dozens of different systems across uh, different areas. You know, in banking that system sits inside a very, very secure parameter. Uh, in an airline, um, you know, uh, a lot of those systems are actually hosted outside. You know, some of my uh, most uh, strategic assets, so the planes actually change location every day. Uh, so, as you can imagine, it's a very uh, challenging and uh, rewarding uh, job being the CISO of Elal, which actually is sitting in this crowd. Um, talking specifically about connected planes, uh, you know, it's my, uh, it's my personal opinion that uh, the probability of something happening in a connected plane due to cyber attack is very, 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 very low. You can add a few varies there. Uh, in general, planes are secure by design. There's a lot of uh, mitigations. Uh, you know, our pilots are the best in the world and they, they train for uh, a lot of adverse events. And if you look historically, as you know, there are thousands of connected planes in the world for the last few years. And you haven't heard a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, events about it. And if something happened, you hear about it. Again, contrast it with how many times you heard about uh, credit cards being uh, uh, out in the open, data leakage. So if, uh, you know, the past is an indication for the future, you can say there's very low probability, uh, at least based on the current data, that uh, uh, something will happen with the connected plane. However, having said that, that doesn't mean that we're not thinking about black swan events. So black swan is an event with very low probability but very big negative impact. And we are doing everything we can to uh, ensure we won't have any uh, black swan events um, and that uh, we minimize any uh, impact that uh, can happen if things like that happen. So we are also investing a lot in that. So as you could see, uh, a broad set of uh, challenges. It's not only around the plane, but it's actually the entire ecosystem, the value chain and the supply chain. Okay, can you uh, talk a bit, talk a bit uh, about the special things you do regarding uh, cybersecurity to prevent this uh, black swan? 
Uh, so uh, I assume that uh, all the people here, uh, you know, know cyber. So I won't talk about the things that all the uh, companies do in cyber. Uh, but uh, like all the companies, we try to do everything we can across all the relevant areas. You know, if you think about, you know, the NIST definition of the, def the different areas around identifying, identifying the threats, protecting your assets, detecting events, uh, responding to them, and recovering. We're investing a lot in each of those areas, from uh, cyber intelligence to uh, training to getting the most cutting edge technology for protection and recovery. Uh, I think something special that we do and is unique to Elal, we realize that uh, Elal is the uh, airline of the startup nation. And uh, the reason why you're all here is because the startup nation has a lot of uh, very strong talent around cyber, a lot of experience, a lot of capabilities. And what we're doing is we're actively looking for uh, cutting edge technologies and uh, capabilities that uh, will help us uh, reinforce and create uh, some sort of a differentiation in uh, our cyber defense. So we're actually working with some very, very uh, unique cutting edge technologies. Um, Argos is an example for a pilot we're doing in that space. Um, and uh, that is our way to try to address as much of the challenges in a, in a, in a, in a faster way than what maybe a, big a bigger enterprise would do. We will get to you uh, later on, but uh, we have heard about Elal. Kobe, can you just give us a bit of a, a yacht of you of the major airlines in the world, how they are uh, related uh, to cyber? I think Shachar uh, gave a very good overview. Um, I'll say the following. Uh, just as, as, a, as an indication of what's going on, today there are like 4 billion passengers globally. Uh, we identify cyber as one of the uh, causes that may jeopardize the growth that we expect that will basically double itself in the next 20 years from 4 billion to 8 billion passengers globally. Uh, cyber is one of the, uh, of, of the key factors. Uh, infrastructure is one of the key factors. Security, of course, is one of the key factors. But uh, specifically, cyber is becoming more and more uh, uh, relevant and it's out in the open, it's clear to everyone. Now, Shahar gave a, a very good overview of, of what a, a well-established airline knows and has the ability and has the resources and has the uh, know-how of how to deal with uh, cyber events. And if I recall correctly, two years ago, we had a similar uh, session here in the university and there was a, a major European airline which also gave a very interesting overview of what they do in terms of cyber defense. But one has to understand and remember that not all the airlines in the world are strong and big and uh, have the ability to to increase uh, their cyber uh, awareness and defense. Um, and as I said, we represent 85% of global aviation traffic. So among those 85%, and we're talking about hundreds of airlines, there are many, many small airlines who don't have the ability. But related to your question, what what is good resilience for such a let's say, a small company, uh, first of all, I think it's, it's to prioritize uh, what are the assets that the airline wants to, to defend. And when we talk about aviation, you know, there is a, a very wide range of, uh, of uh, attack vectors in the aviation field. Of course, flight safety is the number one priority for, for, uh, for the industry and, of course, for the, for the airline. Uh, safety and the safety of the aircraft, the safety of the passengers, of course. But as Shahal rightly said, there are, you know, dozens of systems uh, that an airline operates on a daily basis from uh, uh, financial systems, operational systems, cargo systems, uh, uh, you name it. Of course, airlines are sitting uh, by themselves on very, very big data, so protecting the data is, is of course, a challenge. So I would say, related to, to your question, is prioritize, understand what your vulnerabilities are, and, uh, and uh, create uh, uh, effective plans to, to mitigate those uh, uh, potential risks. I would say that, in, in my view, the most important thing is that uh, um, there is a culture in the airline business, which in, in the airline business, which which is very uh, visible. It's a culture of safety, and it's a culture of security. I think that uh, a good uh, resilience cyber program for an airline is to really uh, copy paste in a way that type of uh, safety culture and security culture, and create uh, uh, a cyber culture as well. 
and of course, uh, when you talk about cyber culture, you're talking about awareness of, of the issues because, for example, we see in many airlines around the world uh, that sometimes uh, cyber events are caused not only because of, of uh, bad intentions to harm the airline, but because of simply uh, negligence of, of even people within the airline. So again, the, the issue of, of uh, awareness is, is critical and creating the right uh, culture uh, within the airline is, is, I think, key. And of course, when you talk about awareness, so you talk about training and you talk about uh, sitting in such forums and understanding what's going on in the world. And, uh, and, and we talk a lot about uh, information sharing. Uh, that's key uh, also for the airlines themselves, you know, because uh, sooner or later almost every airline is, is hit by some sort of, uh, of a cyber uh, event. I wouldn't say attack necessarily, but uh, a cyber event. So uh, again, information sharing and, you know, the willingness to, to be part of the community of the airlines and share what's going on with you is, I think, uh, a very important part in creating the cyber resilience uh, culture, I would say. Yeah, thank you very much, Kobe. And you have mentioned uh, safety, and uh, safety is uh, actually the, one of the leading, uh, I would say, actually DNA of civil aviation. And uh, well, later on, we will try to tackle the question or the subject of how safety, this approach of safety first, um, actually influenced the uh, cybersecurity. So, uh, Brian. We've heard uh, from Shahar and from Kobe about, about airlines. Uh, so uh, we'd like to hear what uh, Boeing, as a major uh, uh, airplane uh, manufacturer, is uh, taking uh, any view, the view of actually of uh, protecting the planes and having a secure, uh, secure design. Sure, yeah, and it, it, it's a lot of the same themes that we've heard before. For Boeing, uh, safety is the number one priority, and with, uh, the core components of safety for us are security and resiliency of the, of the products we put out there. And so when, when you look at, uh, at areas of challenge uh, that, that we look at across from a cyber perspective and security perspective, we, we look at, at, at multiple things, but the, the, the three that I'll talk about, the first is, uh, Securing the ecosystem, and it's uh, making sure that we're not taking a stovepiped look at an individual component of the entire aviation ecosystem. So we can't get too laser focused just on the aircraft. We have to think about it. We have to think about air-to-ground communication systems, SATCOM. Uh, we have to think about the airports where our smart aircraft r receive data from. Uh, we have to think about the MRO systems and the maintainers who have interfaces into uh, into the aircraft. So it, it really is stepping back and taking a holistic approach at what does that aviation security ecosystem look like and, and how do you drive uh, security through each of those capability threads uh, that are that that are in that conceptual diagram uh, that that we that we think through when we think security uh, and and so for us it it, it comes down and you, you did hear it before that it comes down aviation with a safety mindset gains benefits for uh, attributes such as uh, resilient design, uh, fault analysis through, uh, through the design process. So a lot of those things parlay over into making things secure by design. Uh, and, and we're there to make sure that we're driving best practices and we're driving all of the things that we need to do, both from requirements development through the design and development of the aircraft and all the way through sustainment within the life cycle of the aircraft. Uh, and, and so we look at, we look at numerous things. Uh, Boeing has jumped two feet into the digital threads, so we're, we're all in on model-based systems engineering and model-based security engineering. So we ensure that we lay in um, cyber, cyber survivability attributes for every one of our new aircraft and modifications to existing aircraft. Uh, and so we, we start with things from a survivability attribute perspective, uh, like securing communications, um, minimizing attack surfaces, partitioning uh, critical capabilities on the, on, on, the, on the platform. And so when we look at those attributes, those attributes are then allocated down to requirements and design within our aircraft and, and pulled all the way through our test programs uh, to ensure that we're, we're designing and deploying and sustaining the most resilient air, aircraft that, that are possible for us. Uh, and, and we understand, as, uh, as was talked to before with the, with the NIST tenants, we do, we do adhere to a lot of those. Uh, first is, is protect, and so we do, through, through design and through thorough testing, drive uh, the protection of our systems uh, as, as the utmost importance, but we all know that there are events that, that are, are bound to happen, so it's the ability to quickly detect 
uh, respond and recover, and then adapt. So we, we talk to a, a sixth piece when you talk about the five NIST tenants. We, we talk about that, that adaptability both at the system level on the aircraft and the ability for our process and our engineering to adapt quickly to threats uh, as, as threats uh, come and, and, and emerge in the environment. And so uh, the, the second part for us is supply chain. So supply chain is a, is a big concern uh, throughout the aviation ecosystem of ensuring end-to-end -end that we have full security and full visibility into, into what's being developed from a hardware, software, and the data that sits around that. Uh, and and that, that, is, um, that is trusted all the way from uh, tier end developers, or, or tier end suppliers, excuse me, all the way through the OEMs and all the way through out into production and sustainment uh, when we're updating aircraft, when we're, when we're making modifications. And so true understanding and visibility into our supply chain, understanding of, of uh, what we're being delivered and understanding what's in that and thorough cyber testing of that throughout the entire life cycle uh, and, and, having, um, and having that as, as clear as possible. We, we have a couple pilots going on right now with um, using uh, uh, di distributed ledger technologies and other things to, to help drive some, some maturity, uh, some additional maturity into some of those processes that, that we see are, are, are essential for the security of the ecosystem. And I think for us, the third thing is, is probably talent, right? It's, it's skills and talent, finding folks who are aviation cyber um, experts from a, from a uh, um, security perspective are are hard, and where we have multiple companies competing for them, and and so when we look for folks uh, who have good computer science backgrounds, they get they get their traditional IP based uh, security CISSP types of people uh, come in, which is a fantastic foundation. It's getting them the ability to understand aviation systems, uh, understanding how an aircraft works understanding how, um, how to go off and, and exploit attack vectors on non-traditional IP-based systems. So, you know, what does a GPS attack look like against an aircraft? What, is a, what does an RF um, effect against an aircraft look like? How can you help design better and how can you help test to ensure that those susceptibilities aren't going to be found within the products that we make? So, so we at Boeing are, are, have a concerted effort to make sure uh, we've put together a training curriculum uh, working with a couple vendors uh, to really get an aviation-specific cyber um, uh, curriculum built. And so it's, it's for our system security engineers, our architects, and our, our, our dedicated pen test red team, blue team type of folks. Um, and, and so for us, it's, it's um, not only to get the people there, but to keep them, right? So to, to, to retain people, to keep those skills up to date, and to make sure that, that we have the best people in the world testing and making sure that our, our aircraft are, are secure and, and remain resilient through their life cycle. Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, Ruby, I would like to ask you, as being, uh, as being uh, at least here in this forum, I think, being uh, the pilot and the cyber expert all together, which is uh, quite, uh, quite rare, and this is uh, actually uh, some of the key, uh, I think the key for success in this area, this challenging, very challenging area of aviation and cyber security, which aviation is a whole profession uh, with a lot of legacy, and cyber is a new profession relatively, but with its own legacy. So how do you uh, connect them together and how do you leverage that? Thanks for the question. Uh, the bottom line is that it's, it is difficult. <laughs> um, well, since there is a gap, then you need to close the gap from both sides. Uh, the first side is the side that uh, Brian just uh, related to, is to make cyber people understand aviation. The other side is to make <laughs> the aviation players understand cyber, which is also challenging. So first of all, for the, for the first uh, side, um, I had to learn to be a pilot and I had to learn to be a cyber professional and I'm not sure what took me more time. Um, I think that in the end of the day, it took me more time to understand cyber. Um, just move it a little bit. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think that it is uh, easier and more uh, cost efficient and uh, better in any sense to uh, teach cyber people to be uh, aviation experts than to take people who understand aviation and to make them understand 
how a cyber attacker thinks. And uh, this is what we are doing at uh, Argos. We're taking uh, cyber people and we teach them everything that we think uh, they need to know in order to be good industry specific uh, cyber researchers for aviation. And actually this is uh, really a lot because you, there is the technological aspect because you need to understand the protocols. There are uh, protocols unique to aviation. There are operating systems unique to aviation. Uh, some of them, not all of them, and still uh, networks and the um, everything, but there is also the regulation. It's a different regulation. Uh, Argus uh, came from the automotive industry. In no way the automotive industry regulation is similar in any sense to uh, aviation. It's like it's completely different uh, ball game. <clears throat> and the certification process uh, means a lot in what you can and can't do when you uh, think of uh, cyber solutions. And uh, then you need to sit and talk and uh, look uh, eye to eye with the industry players, like with the tier ones, with the tier twos, with the airlines, uh, with the OEMs, the airframers, and see what they need. Because what you think they need is not necessarily what they uh, really need. So it doesn't mean anything if you just develop something that you think is cool and nobody's going to use it. All right, so this is the, 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 the first side. The other side is to make aviation understand cyber. So here I see a great divergence between the different uh, players. Um, let's say uh, Boeing Airbus and the big airframers, like they uh, really understand cyber. And uh, their uh, first uh, tier ones, right? Like uh, Rockwell, Thales, Honeywell, etc. And then uh, the, the, <laughs> the lower you go, uh, the less expertise you find. And uh, this is where you start, you, you have to start market education. And uh, of course, there are the airlines. So actually, El Al is like, I think, a great example of a forward thinking uh, a airline that understands cyber, I think, uh, better than most uh, airlines do because. The, the environment they live into and because like they're surrounded with cyber and maybe other uh, considerations as well. But uh, I, you, you, you may meet with uh, um, airlines that just don't care. All right, and then so you, there is a lot of market education uh, to make, not only with airlines, also with manufacturers, with the uh, in-flight entertainment and connectivity manuf manufacturers, etc., cetera, et cetera. The higher you go, the better exp expert as you find. But uh, I think that this is also something that you should uh, um, deal with when you want to, to close the gap. And the, the last thing is, uh, I would say, uh, I had a conversation about it uh, with uh, Brian before, uh, is trust. Because I think that today the uh, aviation industry uh, does not generally speaking, does not uh, trust the uh, cyber industry uh, enough. Uh, there are, one, one may say that there are reasons for that and it may be true, but in the end of the day, the innovation, uh, most of the innovation is uh, within the, um, the cyber industry. So, um, and the an interaction must, uh, must be made um, but it should be uh, very carefully made from both sides. Uh, so I think um, um, both the uh, cyber industry and the aviation industry um, could do bet better there and should do better. Um, I think that's that. Thank you very much, Ruby. I uh, take at least two points from uh, uh, your speech, uh, one of them, uh, is the trust between the industries. Uh, and this is, uh, again, uh, the way, way of thinking of innovation versus uh, highly innovation or dynamic, the dynamic world of the cyber versus the safety issues of uh, flying civil uh, aviation. And of course, it's all about uh, people, one say. So as a cyber expert, I would, <laughs> you have uh, surprised me because when I asked the question, to my opinion at least, or to my view as a cyber expert, 
was to take aviation guys and teach them cyber, not the opposite way. So that's, I think, uh, uh, something, that's a gap for itself, okay? That just everybody, uh, the two, two, point, two, the two different uh, uh, views on the same subject. So we've heard uh, the industry and uh, the industry and the airlines, uh, and now about the government, what the government uh, sees. So, so a question for you, Mary. Uh, what is the role of uh, the national agencies concerning cyber risk of uh, airplanes and airlines? So in the United States, uh, we have multiple agencies that have different mission areas with respect to aviation and cybersecurity and, of course, aviation cybersecurity. So in this instance, our government of the United States has set up a tri-chair organization. We have three major parts of the government um, involved in this, the Department of Defense, the Federal Aviation Administration, and the Department of Homeland Security. And those three agencies are working together to address this issue holistically and to be able to address all the different mission areas in the United States government because there isn't simply one mission area. So with respect to the Department of Homeland Security, our role in this, in this uh, tri-chair, in addition to participating as one of the tri-chairs, is to do the research and development for the aircraft portion of aviation cybersecurity. So I agree with everything I've heard um, said so far. We have to look holistically at the entire system, look where there are potential um, challenge areas, and then address those. So what we're doing in uh, DHS is we are looking at what's the threat, what is the vulnerability, and what is the consequence. And taking those three things together, looking at what should we focus our resources on testing for. What's the highest risk? What's the highest consequence? What's the most likely? All of those things. After we determine which area to test on, we will conduct some of the testing. And when I say conduct testing, this is all intended to be done in partnership with industry, with the airlines, with the manufacturers, so that we have a holistic uh, community uh, ecosystem-based approach to what we're what we are finding, and then how to mitigate what we are finding. So the role of Department of Homeland Security is not to push the standards, but the Department of Homeland Security can push the recommendations and best practices based on what we've learned so that we can give industry and manufacturers an idea of where we see the vulnerabilities and what we've learned. And that's particularly important because it takes multiple years to push new standards or new regulations. So in our case, what we're trying to do is help, help everybody figure out what are potential vulnerabilities, what are the ones of the highest risk, and then give ideas for recommendations or best practices while we're waiting for the standards to catch up. Thank you very much, Marie. <clears throat> and uh, enough related to the last sentence uh, Marie said about the uh, time that it takes and the time that we don't have. So uh, what, are, what steps a government agency should take to close these gaps? So I um, very much agree with what uh, Mary said and what has been said before, um, especially I think one of the government roles is to uh, uh, mitigate the issue of the capabilities, the cybersecurity capabilities uh, and the workforce availability for uh, the air traffic controllers, for the airport, for the Israeli airlines and for the government themselves. So I think one of our roles as a government is to um, support R&D, is to fund uh, uh, training and the workshop and the relevant uh, exercises, etc. So we will have a capable cybersecurity defense workforce for this industry and for this ecosystem. And they can uh, support uh, industry mission, government missions. We have responsibility when it comes to uh, uh, regulation and uh, we have responsibility uh, to write the correct uh, standards and we have to do it uh, in a knowledge-based uh, manner. We don't want to make uh, over uh, mistakes and over regulation here. So uh, this is um, very much relate to what uh, have been said here before. And um, if you ask me about uh, the focus area, I would love um, if we would more focus on the um, issue of the operation life cycle phase of th those systems uh, in airline and airports in the aircraft themselves, because some of these systems are operate, uh, operative for more than 20 years. And you think about software security over 20 years, you realize that uh, vulnerabilities are being discovered all the time, and um, adversaries are developing their capabilities, and we have to be able to 
uh, have uh, cybersecurity healthcare monitoring to identify what is going on, to have detection capabilities, uh, offline, online, covert capabilities, so we know what's happening. So we have uh, patching capabilities, mitigation capabilities, etc. We have to be always steps ahead and the operational and maintenance phase of those systems is uh, what I think we should focus on. Thanks. Thank you very much. So uh, last question, but uh, only if you can do it very shortly, <laughs> because we don't have time. Uh, it relates to the, uh, considering the long period of uh, at least uh, three or more years, it took uh, it took, uh, take, uh, uh, the aviation standards uh, organizations uh, to approve different new standards for uh, cyber security. What is the first step you would do in order to, in the meantime, in order to try to bridge this, uh, this gap? Who pick uh, the question? <laughs> Kobe. Uh, I think as, as Marie said, uh, the airline industry is based on standards. So if we're looking uh, long term, uh, the airline industry cannot work in silos, meaning in Israel it works one way and in North America it works in a different way. So the ultimate uh, um, objective is to create this uh, consensus and, and, and dialogue and, uh, and agreement in order to, to fulfill this uh, part of the, of the DNA of the industry, which is the standards with the ultimate objective of, of creating um, uh, good, good cybersecurity. What's the definition of good cybersecurity? Uh, it's, it's a question of how uh, the consensus will be achieved and how the, the dialogue will be, will be continued. And uh, uh, I think that's, that's the objective from now on looking forward. And, uh, and of course, uh, we heard here the issue of partnership and we heard the issue of trust. And this is all the same, uh, the same uh, vocabulary in different ways, but we need to build commonly uh, a consensus in order to eventually create uh, a good uh, cyber environment for the airline business. So uh, I don't think that anybody should wait for regulation because you don't need to, if, if you're concerned about something, then don't wait so that somebody else will force you to do anything. I mean, you can choose to do it, right? Anybody, any actor can choose to do it uh, if they are concerned about cyber. And actually, there is some regulation in place, but it's not mandatory as for now, because there is the DO 326A and the DO uh, uh, 355 and 356A and all the European uh, equivalents, uh, ED200, uh, 3, 4, etc. So it's there, right? And uh, there are the circulars, uh, AC 119-1, etc. And there is the ANSOG, uh, Boeing's hand ANSOG, Airbus has their uh, security handbook. So, I mean, the, the, what uh, airlines or in the manufacturers could do in the meanwhile is just there. I mean, it is specified pretty clearly. It is right that it's not mandatory today to some extent, and, but uh, as far as I understand, it's going to be uh, sooner than later. <laughs> At least this is my hope. But uh, um, there are like really trivial things uh, uh, that, for example, airlines can do, like uh, monitoring the security laws of the re-enabled fleets, like what El Al started doing. Uh, this is something that everybody is saying all the time that airlines should do. They just need to do it. That's all, all right? They don't need regulation for it. And uh, doing the risk assessment and pen testing. And I mean, in the IT uh, ecosystem, this is just uh, stuff that uh, companies are doing all the time. So there shouldn't be any different. They don't need to wait for regulation, all right? And this is actually, um, I, I know that there are many uh, actors that are doing it right now, right? Uh, but there are those who don't because uh, they don't have to, okay? So it's only a matter of what you, you want to do, what you choose to do. And uh, if somebody choose to be like a, a good student and not like the last in the class, then 
it's it's pretty obvious what they should do. They just should, if they're on the airline, uh, open DO355, read everything that is written there, read Boeing's uh, circulars, and do whatever they, uh, they are told to do there and recommended to do there, and that's that. So thank you very much. So we are again back to the awareness subject, and the awareness is very important, and the awareness is very easy to achieve. The next steps, as uh, Ruby said, are a bit more complicated, but it's uh, achievable, it's doable. So thank you very much for uh, the panel. Thank you to Mary, to Inav, to Shachar, Kobe, Ruby, and Bob.